Uh, let's get started. Um, I want to start with a few things about this second homework. Um, and before I get into that, did you get to read the second homework and do you have any questions about it? Anything we can clarify right now? Yes, please. So when we do the first assignment, it uses all the lines of random.c in mm -hmm. some way, but the different versions of Python, random.c doesn't guarantee to be the same result. Mm -hmm. And so I did spend a lot of time with the first assignment just trying to find a C that worked on the autograder, even though I got a yeah. personal machine. Uh, is there like any way we could get some set that works in the Gotcha. Okay, so first of all, uh, we have this cre so we, we got an accuracy that's two percent higher than what we expect from you in the homework. So um if you have small differences now due to randomness, it won't matter as, as much because uh you won't get from randomness more than two percent, or we don't expect you will get more than two percent of your accuracy change. So I think even in the current setup, um it shouldn't matter that much. Um, but I guess I guess we could set the random seed, it's just that setting random seeds is really, really hard. Um, I mean, we could, you know, like just do the random dot seed and set it to something, but there are so many other seeds from Torch, from the hardware itself. So even in research, we have like 10 lines of code to set the seed and then we still don't, don't you know, there is still some randomness. Uh, so I'm just a little bit, um, yeah, concerned that we won't be able to achieve it, but we can look into it and see whether we can um, make it a little bit more deterministic. Any other questions, maybe conceptual questions? Okay, yeah, I will, uh, next time on Monday, I will again start with asking you and yeah, if please, if you have any questions, especially if you can't come to the office hours, ask here we are happy happy to help with that um okay one thing i didn't mention before that i think is uh you should you should be aware of is in general but also for homework is that when we have these embeddings that i mentioned the way we store them in this, is in a so-called embedding matrix where each uh each row in uh, this embedding matrix correspond to embedding of a token in your vocabulary. So if you're, uh, uh, so the first first row in this uh, matrix is going to be the embedding for your first um, uh, uh, token in the vocabulary. Um, yeah, you will probably start index things with zero. So like, and here you will also retrieve by uh, looking at the first, like the first row will have index zero. So um just have that in uh, mind so we start with this uh this kind of a matrix and next thing we do is we tokenize our inputs uh of course we need to have you know connection between uh the tokens in the embeddings matrix with the tokens in the vocabulary so you must tokenize in the same units you have you can't have a vocabulary that consists of words and then tokenize in subwords. Then you will have a lot of unknown words, right? So you need to have you need to use uh, the same kind of a tokenizer that has been used to produce the embeddings. Um, and for you, that's going to be just a white space tokenizer in the homework. When you tokenize, you get some tokens, and then each token has an its own index in the vocabulary, right? And what we do next is so-called a lookup information, which basically means that you retrieve the row from your embedding matrix with that same uh, index. So here we have a word A that corresponds to an index 1037. The next thing you do is you retrieve the row 1037 from your embedding matrix, and that's going to be embedding for that specific token. And that operation is called lookup, not something I have mentioned before. Uh, it's a, it's again, common phrase that you should be aware of. Okay, so there isn't anything extra here, just a little bit of how we store these things and how we uh, work with them. Uh, with the deep averaging network you're implementing for your second homework, you will get those seven embeddings and then you're going to average them and that 
uh, resulting vector is going to be input to your uh, neural network that you are implementing. Okay, so just wanted to mention that. Again, any questions? Yeah. That's how it works. I'm sure we do some hypothesis like get rid of the stop words or. Um, I don't remember exactly. Uh, things are specified in the homework. I believe that you are given a Python script where um, things are already lowercase and tokenized for you. So I don't think you need to be doing that okay. as far as I'm aware of, but you know, double check. So do you usually just have like a dictionary that like from the, the word to its index in the array to the matrix? So we always have a vocabulary, right? Like we, uh, as we said, like we start with a string, but strings are split into sequence of tokens. Tokens are uh, what our vocabulary is made of, right? So uh, vocabulary or a dictionary, it's uh, maybe the same way to refer to the, to the same thing. So you'll have your vocabulary, you have index for each token in the vocabulary. And then um, when you use embeddings, you will have an embedding matrix where each row corresponds to the same, um, to, you know, index zero here refers to an embedding of a token in the, uh, the uh, with the index zero in your vocabulary. So is, is it a different data structure that maps the, the word or the token to index in that array? Mm. Like if, you, if you're given a word, like a token, how do you know like which, where it is in the yeah, so if you have a vocabulary, um, so we have here some order already, right? So uh, here we already from from the um, you know the embeddings that will also provide us information about the index, I believe. Uh, and then you you map to the same thing. But if you have different vocabulary, you can still do a little mapping between. Like if you had a vocabulary where index uh, for a word dog is zero, but in uh, someone else had developed embeddings and the in their vocabulary dog is indexed with two, you can still have a mapping between those two. So um, I don't know, like, I don't know what exactly um, is the situation in general. I honestly don't remember anymore, but it's not a technical challenge by no means, right? Okay, other questions? All right, um, please read the uh, assignment soon, immediately, preferably. Check any any questions you might have early on. Remember debugging for machine learning is trickier and it will take a little bit longer than for usual algorithms. Um, I want to recap a few things I finished off in the last lecture and provide a few clarifications as well that I think we need. And then we'll move into machine translation. Uh, remember, we have said that now up to our spring break, we are going to try to work up to large language models and understand what they are. I have told you that the task language modeling that we learned last uh, in the last lecture was one important piece that had led into large language models. Machine translation is another task that had also influenced it. So today we are covering these, you know, more classical NLP tasks to kind of work up to our neural architecture called transformers. And next week, that will be the basis of uh, everything we'll talk about until this uh, spring break. Um, and as I said, last uh, last uh, Monday, we talked about neural language modeling. Language modeling is a task of uh, given some uh, special token that says begin this sequence. Uh, you should be predicting the next word in a sequence, given the sequence of preceding tokens. And we have said that we need some kind of hidden representation in neural language modeling that uh, is a representation of the sequence so far based on which you are gonna to try to predict the next word. So uh, I, I was kind of vague with what that is exactly, because as I said, next week, we are gonna talk about transformers and that's going to give us representation that we care about. But to, just to make it a little bit more concrete, we have you know, very briefly talked about recurrent neural networks or RNNs for short, which uh, take, um, uh, take a previous hidden representation of that captures uh, history of the sequence so far. It takes the current representation of your 
current uh, uh, token, the, the last token you see in your history, and some bias term, as always, which I usually fold. Um, and then you apply nonlinearity. Um, here, um, maybe I can just write this down a little bit. Okay, so um, let's say we have a sentence, a dog, and then we are trying to uh, predict the next word. Here uh, in the first layer of RNN, we are gonna have uh, a token uh, embedding. So such, for example, word to weck embedding of a word A. And then we are going to feed it into our neural network and it's going to uh, do some computation uh, with it. Here we have uh, this equation. Let me see over here. So this becomes your age one. You set your age one to be just the uh, word to work embedding of the word A. Um, and then, um, oh yeah, thanks. Uh, that's your age one. Um, you had age zero because we are starting with the you know, first token to be uh, some something random and you are doing the computation WH1 plus VH0 plus some bias vector, and you are applying nonlinearity. And that will give you now uh, a new representation of the first token, H1. So we are updating it. And then when we go to a next word, dog, we have X2, word to weck embedding of the word dog. And uh, we are then updating the H2 to be 10 age of the WH2, which is just the word to work embedding, plus VH1, plus bias term. So see here, now we have included this representation of the history before. Okay. And then if we are having a deep recurrent neural network and we usually have deep networks, your uh, note that your, your representation of each one of these is not the word to weck embedding, rather the H1 that has been um, transformed with a nonlinear operation. So, um, so here, if you had a you know, two layer recurrent neural network, your H1 would be 10 age of uh, WH1 plus VH0 uh, bias term, but note that H1 here is this one, which is nonlinear, right? So it would just feed the output of the previous layer to be input in the next layer. So only in the very, very first layer, you use word to weck embeddings. Later on, as we have seen with the uh, feed forward neural networks, you're just uh, giving the output of the previous layer as an input to the uh, next layer. Okay, um, so this is how we uh, how we are uh, building representations of our history, and then uh, to predict the next word, we have approached this uh, problem as as a basically classification uh, problem. Uh, these equations here are almost identical to the equations I have given you for a feed-forward neural network. You have your output space, which is for us vocabulary because we are trying to predict the next word. So possibilities for the next words are words in the vocabulary. Our output matrix is the size of the output space, which is the size of the vocabulary, therefore the number of words in the vocabulary times dimension, hidden, uh, hidden representations dimension. And we are making a distribution over vocabulary by applying the softmax, exponentiate and normalize, and therefore squash between zero and one. So each value, each one of the tokens in a vocabulary is associated with some probability of being the next word. And if we really want to display the next word, like ChatGPT, we need to actually sample from this distribution and one way to sample is to take the word with the highest probability. And that's called the greedy decoding. And today or next time, depending on how much time we have, we're gonna see other types of decoding. Greedy is not always what we want. And this is going to give you um, next token in a given position. 
or we say at a given time stamp. But you need to do this again, right? You have predicted the next word, and now you want to predict again the next word, the next word, the next word until you have reached end of a sequence token. So we are repeating this to predict the next uh, token, but the history is one token longer, and it's a uh, change over here, right? That's why we why we have subscript T here, denoting the position, uh, decoding position we are at. So unlike classification, where we do this once, we repeat this operation until we have reached what the model deems the end of the text. Okay. Um, one thing that you might be asking yourself is if I had predicted the next token, what is the input in the next time step? That token I have predicted or what has been seen in the original uh, text I'm trying to model. Um, so just to be clear, when we are doing neural language modeling, we start with the corpus and we sample some text from this corpus. For example, we might have a movie review. Sylvester has Stallone has made some movies, blah, 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 blah. We have that text and we use that text to try to do this next word prediction. We start with the beginning of sequence token, a special token that we add to our vocabulary. And then we train the network to predict the next word, for example, Sylvester and so on. Imagine that at uh, this position, after the word Stallone, we have predicted the word that the highest probable word is, is. But in the original review, we had word has. Now, the question is, do you use is or has in as the input for predicting the next word after that word? And with a technique called teacher forcing, you are actually not going to use the word you have predicted. I mean, you your model has predicted, but you are going to use the word that had actually appeared in the input. The reason why we want to do this are twofold. First of all, it makes everything faster because you don't need to actually sample from your distribution to uh, put that input into, you know, to create your input. So you don't need to do things sequentially. Rather, you can immediately make a tensor where you have uh, tokens and a corresponding representation of those tokens that had appeared in actual text. So you don't need to build your input sequentially, rather you have it immediately as a tensor, which we like. We don't like to do things sequentially because things get slow. So speed is one reason. Another reason is that your model is not gonna be good in the beginning. So it's going to produce things that don't make any sense. And then if you're giving this as supervision, your model will have a hard time learning. So using the ground truth as input instead of model output from prior time step is called teacher forcing. And teacher forcing itself is not ideal as well, because at the inference time, when we are actually trying to generate these words, like chat GPTs, let's say, you don't know what the goal truth is, right? So you do not have an option over here. This is not an option to use the word that has actually appeared because you have no idea what that word is. You, you are now trying to generate it. So at the inference time, you must use what you have generated. And, um, and this presents what, like a discrepancy between what we are doing at the training time and what we are doing at the test time. Uh, which in machine learning causes issues, right? Um, if the model needs to be really robust for, to not be affected by these discrepancies, which is not something we can always achieve. So because of this discrepancy, uh, the model will do errors and that errors are gonna accumulate quickly along the generated sequence. So what has been proposed instead is so-called scheduled sampling where you first start with uh, giving what was originally in the input during training, but then gradually during training, as your model becomes a little bit better at generating, you start using the outputs of the model rather than what has appeared in the actual uh, data set. This is also sometimes known as curriculum learning, where you are 
uh, have some kind of progression from hard, like from easier to harder setup. Um, so yeah, that's that's what you you can also do. Schedule sampling. Start with giving the ground truth text, but eventually give the uh, the um, outputs of the model itself. Okay, so. I also want to remind you how we trained our uh, feed-forward neural networks. Um, basically, what we have done is just taken the uh, log probability, which is for us logarithm of the softmax, right? Of the uh, where we take the actual value where the gold truth, the gold label is, and. Here with neural language mod language modeling, nothing has changed, right? I have said just a couple slides back that the equations are the same. We just changed the output space. Now it's way larger. It's 30, 30, 000, we have 30,000 labels instead of just two as in case of binary classification. So we have this exact same loss at each token prediction step. That's it, we don't, nothing has changed. And as I said, as the true label, we are using a token that actually occurred in the text next. So whatever had appeared in the text in next, you deem that to be your uh, ground truth label. The only difference with classification is that you're doing these predictions and calculating your losses at every time step, because you are not doing one prediction, you are doing as many predictions as there are words in your output. So you have multiple losses. If you had generated sequence of K tokens, you are going to have K losses. So what you're gonna do is you're going to average these K losses to produce one number, and then you're going to use that mean value to compute your gradients and do backpropagation. So again, not much has changed, except that you have multiple losses at multiple uh, prediction steps. And you are using as true label what has actually appeared in text, which of course is a little bit trickier setup than classification where ground truth is um, more objective in a way, like more people would agree what should be the ground truth there. Whereas with what should come next, um, there are many possibilities. So it's, it's a ground truth in one sense, that's what we have, so we are using it but it's not the actual only option uh, in the world. So it's a simplification. Um, we are using what we have, but it's not the only possible ground truth. So you do need lots of data to actually do this right. Okay, questions about this? You could, I think, uh, but it would be really slow, right? Remember, we don't even want to do back uh, actual back propagation at um, every instance level. We do batches, so we have eight examples, and only then we update all the weights. So here you are proposing even a le level lower, which is you know at a single instance at every step. So that would be really, really slow. Yeah. But it's going to be really, really slow. Uh, in the end, you do need to have the, the difference between these two things. Um, um, you know, even with this procedure right now with batching and everything, your pre-training, like doing this neural language modeling takes six months. Um, so, it's super slow, right? Uh, so you don't really want to make that process even slower. Um, that's one thing I think you might. I'm I'm not sure what I what I'm gonna say now. I'm not hundred percent sure it would be a problem, but you also uh, your gradients might be a too noisy in a sense that your gradient and at the beginning might be way larger than your gradients later on, uh, which might also affect the learning because if you have these enormous gradients, then Again, uh, you are making drastic changes, which you don't really want. Uh, but it's not like I have an experiment in mind that someone tried this, it's just the intuition. Okay, um, 
I also want to make a, just a slight digression uh, be, and explain the difference between negative log likelihood and cross entropy. Uh, I didn't mention cross entropy so far at all. I have always talked about minimizing negative log likelihood. Um, however, you might have heard uh, other folks here, if they have taken other courses, or maybe if you search things on the web, you, you might have heard also cross entropy, minimize cross entropy, and maybe that was uh, confusing because uh, people use these terms interchangeably. And people use these terms interchangeably because in the context of logistic regression and therefore softmax with our activation functions, um, these things are indeed interchangeable. Uh, they refer to basically the same thing. So remember with logistic regression, we had the deep, and a binary classification setup. We had these equations for probability and then our minimization of negative log likelihood was basically minimizing the sum of negative log probabilities where probabilities actually refer to these specific probabilities. Mm -hmm. um, if we have written, denoted our labels with plus one and zero instead of minus one for the negative label. So if you use zero, to denote negative label, then you could have written the negative log likelihood equation in this way. Uh, so this thing and this thing are the same. They are the same because if your gold label was uh, positive, you would have minus one times log probability of positive class, minus one minus one would be zero. So this term would disappear. And if you had zero for your negative class, then minus zero times this would be would disappear. It will become zero. And what we would have is minus one minus zero is one. So minus one times log probability. And here one minus probability of positive class is the same as the probability of the negative class. So you basically had folded both of these cases in this one equation if you had used zero for your negative class. Okay, now, just a little uh, uh, digression within the regression. The definition of cross entropy, uh, it is a measurement that measures the, um, the basically the difference of these two distributions. So it comes from information theory. If you have distribution P and Q, then your cross entropy is defined by this term. Um, what does this mean for us? If we have P to be the one hot encoding of our gold label, meaning if um, our we would have a vector of the size of the number of labels we have, and it will have uh, one at the place of the index where the of the index of the gold label, and otherwise it will be zero. So that's a, in a way distribution. It's distribution because it all the value sums to one, right? And Q is the our model's probability vector, and we have used softmax to kind of denote the probability vector of our model. Um, of our model. So now, if you plug in those things into this equation, you will get this exact equation over here. So in that sense, these two things are the same. Minor difference is that in implementation in Torch, you have Torch NN cross entropy and Torch NN, NN NLL loss. You might wonder why we would have these two things if they are the same. The only difference is they, they implement the same thing, but cross entropy uh, implicitly is going to apply a softmax followed by log transformation, and this loss will not. You will need to apply softmax and log a transformation and then give it to this uh, function. So they are computing in the end, this, uh, the output is gonna be the same, but what you're given is the input is, is slightly different. So have in mind that these two things are the same. If you see someone uses cross entropy or NLL in Torch, uh, then you need to give slightly different input. And that's the only difference between these th 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 two things for us. Okay, so that was just a slight digression. I don't want you to be confused as people start to talk about cross entropy. So we can use these things interchangeably. Okay, that brings me to new topics. So just want to stop here and see whether things with uh, neural language modeling are clear. The task is to predict next word. We have kind of used the same intuitions we have used for classification and feed forward neural networks. 
Uh, we have seen slight changes. Our hidden representation needs to capture history so far. Uh, we have seen that the loss is this the average loss at different steps. Um, but other than that, our output space is uh, vocabulary. It has you know thirty thousand options. Stuff like that have changed, but nothing has majorly uh, majorly changed relative to what we have seen with the fleet forward neural networks. All of that said, are there any questions about neural language modeling? At this point, I would really like you to be like, okay, I get this. Okay. All right, then let's move on to the next topic, machine translation. Machine translation uh, is one of these holy grail problems in AI, because if you could translate between any languages, then you have this amazing uh, impact, good impact on the society, right? We enable this communication about among people uh, despite our language differences. And therefore, it's one of the oldest NLP tasks. Uh, it, uh, already in the 50s, it had funding. Uh, there was a funding for machine translation. And um, when we look into the statistical NLP approaches, it was one of these tasks that received lots of attention. The task, as you can imagine, you have a sentence in some source language. We use this terminology, like the language we are translating from is called source. Language, for example, in Croatian, we might have a sentence, danas ćemo naučiti o strojnom prevođenju, which uh, we would, with machine translation, automatically translate it into a sentence in the target language, for example, in English, that would be today we will learn about machine translation. That's it, like as in human translation just done by machines. And to do this, we'll need a so-called bytext or a parallel corpus which is a set of sentences or um, larger pieces of text and their translations. So we have for every you know, piece of text in one language, we have its translation in an another language and therefore it's parallel because it, the content is the same. Human translations are called reference translations and machine translations are called hypothesis translations. All of the terms I have put in both here are legit terms we use when we talk about machine translation. So try to use them to be, you know, at the same page with people who know about this. Okay, and translation is challenging because, you know, human translators reword, reorder, rearrange words. We replace single words with multi-word expression and multi-word expression with single word expressions. Just to show you some example, in Croatian, I might ask, Kako se osjećaš? which in a literal translation would be, how do you feel? But reworded translation might be, how are you doing? It's, it's basically the same, uh, the, the same this, you are asking the same information. If I do literal back translation of how are you doing, in Croatian, I would get, Kako ti radiš? which doesn't make, it's like, I might ask it, but in a completely different context. So it's not like it's incoherent, in, the, in Croatian, but it doesn't have to do anything with the question of how are you doing in English. I might ask, uh, I might say, Jučar sam kupila knjigo. Literal translation would be yesterday I bought a book, but the translator might actually write about a book yesterday, which might sound a little bit nicer in English. If I back translate I bought a book yesterday in uh, in Croatian, I would get ja sam kupila knjigo Jučar, which is really weird in Croatian because we don't really specify pronoun I when I, you know, if I sing, I'm bought something and I don't really say the pronoun I, I sounds redundant in, in Croatian. And then we might have machine za paranje posuđa, which is literally machine for washing dishes, which will, of course, say, say dishwasher in English and the single word back translation doesn't exist in Croatian. So we have all these challenges, right? It's, it's, it's not like where to like, straightforward to go from a source language to and translate it in another language. That's why this task hasn't been addressed when it's, you know, this challenge started in the 50s. And to this date, we don't have translate a machine translation among any pairs of languages. If they if we don't have ton of data, we don't probably have a machine translator for that pair of languages. Okay, so 
today because my goal here is to build up to um to transformers and transformers and ideas around them had kind of evolved from the work in neural machine translation. I won't give you uh, the big history of what has been done for machine translation be be before neural machine translation, especially because we also need to learn about some of these linguistic structures that we are gonna learn after the spring break. So um, at some point I might come back to the machine translation and today I will just give you a really, really, really brief and really quick overview of what has been done uh, before neural uh, machine translation. In terms of the conceptual framework of how to model machine translation, you will see this uh, Wakwa's paradigm, mm -hmm. um, which says that we can uh, translate from source to target language by translating from word by word or phrase by phrase. And that's largely what has been done before uh, neural, uh, neural approaches, or I mean, even with neural approaches. Another idea is that you work with syntax, maybe. If you know that there is this, um, there you, you are given a source sentence and you then uh, figure out, aha, uh -huh, this is the syntactic grammar structure of this sentence in a source language, you might try to search for uh, sentences in the target language that have similar grammatical structure, uh, which of course is hard because grammar is not universal. Or semantics, which has said that semantics deal with meaning. So if you had some kind of linguistic representation that grounds semantics, we could also with the same analogy say, okay, um, we are looking for the sentences in the target language that have the similar similar uh, semantic representation. Maybe we have some kind of logical rules and we are seeing whether the rules in the source language are the same as in the uh, target language. And then interlingua is this almost like a philosophical concept of we should have representations where, uh, where all of these things will be uh, the same in the source uh, and target language. And as I said, mostly things have been focused on this uh, word to word and phrase uh, level translation. Word alignment is an important concept. Uh, it's an idea that, especially for word to word models, that each word in the source should be aligned to word in the translation. So again, going back to my example in creation, which uh, literally translates to yesterday I bought a book, you see that these words are um, are are connected to each other. So Ucher is the same um, is the same word uh, for yesterday. Uh, kniga is uh, same as book. And then we see like a little bit of strange things here. We don't have both is actually two words in Croatian. So one uh, two source uh, words can uh, align to one word target word. Uh, and then if I if we translate it in a more nicer way in English, we also see that we have these weird things where now the first word aligns to the last word. So you have these uh, complexities. Okay, so very quickly, this is like lots of information on my slide. I just wanna go over, uh, over it very quickly. Um, there are so-called word alignment models, which assume there is a alignment as the one I have shown you uh, here, where each to each word in a source aligns with one or more words in the target uh, target uh, sentence. So, um, for example, this is an uh, this is English Spanish example. Vinay le gusta Python, which translates into Vinay uh, likes Python. And here again, you have uh, from source into target um, uh, alignments except the first word A that doesn't translate into, into, uh, into anything. And these models aim to then uh, model the joint probability of the alignment and the, and the translation. Uh, it, we will not work through that, but if we had, we would have similar kind of approach, like when we try to derive logistic regression, where we say probability of uh, alignment and you know, joint probability of alignment 
and the translation equals to something and we would use some kind of assumptions such as that each alignment decision is independent of each other, which is questionable, that each source token depends only on its aligned token in the target sequence. Again, questionable, but as always in machine learning, we bring these assumptions to make the some probability that we wouldn't know how to model and compute. Uh, we make it, uh, we, you know, simplify it such that we can actually compute it like we did last time with uh, using Markov assumption for language modeling. And then to actually estimate parameters, you would use an algorithm called expectation maximization algorithm. So again, I'm intentionally very vague here. I just want to give you a sense of you know, how you would approach this, but I'm not giving you any details and then we might come back to this. Uh, the issue with the word uh, word to word uh, alignment is that, yeah, in some, in real translation, we might not have word to word substitutions. Many multi-word expressions are not gonna be translated literally. So here again, in Croatian, we have a, a sentence, idem on a kavu. Literally, that would mean English, we we go to coffee, which actually in English you will say we'll have coffee. So we don't have this, um, it's not literal uh, word to word alignment, but we know that this phrase, idem ona, and we'll have our, that that phrase is translation, um, that we'll have is a translation of uh, idem ona in Croatian. So you do phrase to phrase alignment rather than word to word alignment. <laughs> Again, not giving you any details of how exactly we would uh, approach this. Because in 2014, what had happened uh, is neural machine translation. And it was, if you know anything about computer vision and how, you know, like once uh, neural networks had emerged for computer vision for image classification, that's the kind of uh, NLP moment of that, where now suddenly there was this neural model that had uh, managed to have these huge uh, increases in machine uh, translation and then had spiral um, neural approaches into NLP. Okay, backbone of neural machine translation is sequence to sequence model, uh, which was published by Sutskever et al, which you might, the name might ring a bell if you know anything about OpenAI. And this is a very simple uh, idea that you tackle any task as a sequence to sequence transformation. So given some sequence, you are gonna produce another sequence. And for machine translation, that makes a lot of sense, right? We have a source sequence and we wanna produce the, the same content in the target language. With other tasks, it's not so clear that this is a sequence to sequence, that it can be addressed as a sequence to sequence approach. And I will show you an example later. But a lot of current approaches in AI in general are now approaching this manner, sequence to sequence, despite the problem itself not sounding like transformation of sequences. And this is an example of what we also call the conditional text generation or conditional language model. Uh, remember, language modeling is the task of predicting the next word. And here you're just conditioning it on a sequence a, a, a sequence of tokens that are in another language. But then what you're doing is again, next token prediction. Originally, it has been approached with the so-called encoder decoder neural architecture. Think about it as just a neural architecture like RNN uh, we have talked about, but now it's kind of split into two components. First component, so-called encoder, is going to take a sentence of any length, which is important. Now it has the flexibility to model a sentence regardless of how long it is. And it's going to transform this entire sentence into a vector, a hidden representation that's going to represent this whole sequence. Then your encoder, which is again, just like not an end, it's going to take that hidden representation and it's going to generate uh, token by token, whatever we wish to do. Here we are talking about machine translation, therefore it's going to predict the next token. So if you think about your neural language modeling we have seen before, 
The thing that has changed is when we start predicting the first word, we are, instead of conditioning it on age zero, which is whatever, some like representation of maybe beginning of sequence token or something, we condition it on a representation of the source language, of sentence in a source language. Um, originally, encoder and decoders are implemented as RNNs, as you might suspect, since I keep bringing up, this will be a transformer architecture for us that we'll learn about next week. And uh, we'll also talk about how we can approach sequence to sequence, uh, how we can tackle sequence to sequence problem with a decoder only, where we don't have um, necessarily this encoder over here. Okay. So the idea is very simple, transform sequence into another sequence. And I will visualize this uh, here. Let me just map my brain and this image. So here we have a sentence. Uh, I, I believe this is French and we are gonna probably translate it in English. We have this encoder RNNs and then we have decoder RNNs. And what here, focus on this part, how these hidden rep representations are going to uh, spit out. So we start translating hidden representation, next word, hidden representation, next word, hidden representation. Hidden representation goes into decoder and decoder now starts to decode the words. That's kind of visual representations of this uh, encoder decoder approach. Questions about this? Okay, seems like we are accepting this. This is the same thing, just static representation. Um, here we again have a source sentence, target sentence. I don't know why this example is so violent, um, <laughs> but here is the encoder RNN, here is the decoder RNN. You are just putting your word by word into your RNN and you are building this representation that at this point should capture this whole sequence. And then when you start to generate the words, you are getting first this sequence, this hidden vector that represents this entire sequence. But if you ignore this part and you know, like ignore this, nothing has really changed relative to our neural language modeling, right? And this is why we can think about it as a conditional language modeling because we just condition it on this hidden representation that represents the entire source sequence. In terms of optimization, again, similar to neural language modeling, at each uh, decoding step, at each time step, we will predict some word, but we know what is the actual translation because we have the parallel corpus. And we, not only that we have a parallel corpus, it's usually a huge parallel corpus. So whatever we predict over here, uh, we are going to compare it to what actual human translator had said should be predicted. And we'll have our loss, standard loss, and we are going to then sum these losses, average them, use the average loss, calculate the gradient with respect to that of that value with respect to each one of these inputs, and uh, we are going to change the weights with backpropagation and stochastic gradients descent or its better versions like Adam. So again, relative to relative to um, neural language modeling, not much has changed again. I mentioned that this sequence to sequence approach it makes sense for many tasks, right? Like for machine translation, because the goal is to transform sequence to sequence, it's not crazy to approach it as a sequence to sequence approach. And this is the case, for example, for other NLP tasks, such as summarization, where the goal is given a document or a collection of documents to produce another sequence, a summary. Again, you have sequence of articles, or one article is a sequence of tokens and you just produce a shorter sequence. Or a dialogue, we have uh, utterances and then we need to produce next utterance. All the utterances merged together are our sequence. And then the next utterance is our target sequence. 
But then what uh, is strange with these sequence to sequence problems is that you can approach things which are very structured as a sequence to sequence problem. So this is a problem that we're going to learn about after the spring break called syntactic parsing, where given a sentence, you are trying to produce uh, a parse tree of that sentence. And this is an example of a parse tree. Uh, you can treat this problem as a sequence to sequence problem, where you use some linearization scheme to linearize this, uh, this tree into a sequence. You use these brackets to denote uh, you know, children of the node. And you approach the problem of parsing as a sequence to sequence problem. And this is where things got a little bit weird, where now problems that are inherently not sequence transformation problems could be approached as like that. And not only approach, but we could do them better by approaching them in this way, which has been also a little bit disappointing for anyone who cares uh, about the structure uh, as well. Okay, any questions about neural machine translation or neural language modeling? Or any comments, thoughts? Okay. If not, then we are going to move forward with decoding strategies. Um, we are going to talk about how else we can actually display the word given the distribution of our vocabulary. And after that, we can talk about how we are going to evaluate these uh, sequences we have produced, right? What's going to be our evaluation uh, metric? So first, uh, regarding decoding strategies, the simplest one I have already mentioned is greedy decoding, where once you have your probability over the vocabulary, you can take the whatever word has the highest probability associated with it and display that word. So you're taking argmax the same way you did with classification. So here we have the, and then uh, there were uh, three top words are dog, nice, and car with probabilities 0 0.4, 0 0.5, 0 0.1, and you will uh, predict nice because nice has the highest probability. The issue with the uh, greedy decoding is that it misses high probability tokens hidden behind a low probability token. So here, after word dog, you have word has that has 0.9 probability, really, really high probability, but will not reach it because we have taken this uh, greedy approach we have where we miss the word dog just because we have taken this higher probability word. So an easy alternative is to keep the most likely num beams of hypothesis at each time step. Um, num beams is the number of beams you want to keep. Let's say the num beams is set to two. Then instead of taking just one, uh, you know, highest probability, you will take uh, two. So here uh, we have dog and nice, right, being the highest probable uh, sequences. Uh, highest probable next words, and you are going to record both of them. And this will allow you to come to this path where you will then take um, two highest probable has and whatever one of these two would be. And you're keeping all of these sequences. And once you are done, uh, you reach end of um, sequence token with all of the uh, possible paths. You have collection of sequences. You have their probabilities, right? The joint probability is just the product of conditional probabilities along the way. Then you take whatever is the highest probable sequence as your generated sequence. And that's the one you actually display. Problems with uh, beam search are the repetitions. You have not um, lived, I mean, you lived, but you did not work in the era of poor text generators. You work in an era of chat GPT. But in 2018, what would happen when we would train models like this that would start generating the, 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 or a, 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 a. And I mean, it would be so annoying and frustrating to see it. And a huge technical challenge was to avoid repetitions. Um, and people have produced uh, suggestions such as engram pen penalties, where you manually uh, forbid model to generate uh, engrams that can, um, that you have seen before. So if you had 
uh, let's say you forbid that uh, two grams appear twice. Uh, if you have, uh, let's say, generated New York once, and now uh, you want to generate it again, you are at new and the next highest probable word is York, you will set the probability manually to zero for York. And that will disallow the model to ever consider this engram again, which is weird. Imagine you are writing a manual about you know, what to do in New York, and now you forbid the model to mention the city twice. Doesn't make any sense, right? Like you, It's normal in language to use some uh, repetition. Um, that's one issue, repetitions. The other issue is that high quality, and this is the issue with greedy search as well, high quality human language does not follow the distribution of high, high probability uh, next words. So always generating high probability next words is not gonna produce a language that sounds human-like. Uh, this is a this is a graph from the Holtzman and Al who proposed another decoding technique, our final and best one that we'll see, where they have shown under some model and some uh, text uh, which is generated by um, about the same content gen generated with Beam Search and human produced version, the probability under some model of human words are, you know, they have this high fluctuation. We use high probability words, but a lot of low probability words as well. Whereas the what happens when we when we have these decoding strategies that always produce the highest words, we are just going highest probable words. We are going to for all of them have high probability. Um, this is related to the concept like of having more creative text, right? Um, something that we also want with our uh, chatbots like ChatGPT, uh, but not not always do. So, and one way to kind of tackle this issue of we are always producing highest probable words mm -hmm. is to sample from our distribution. So instead of taking the highest probable word, we sample uh, from this distribution at random. And because some words will have higher, you know, will be assigned higher probability in our you know, soft max factor that will be sampled more. However, those that are have really low probability due to chance will also be sampled, right? Um, and this is the big issue if we would just try to sample from the soft mass vector. If I would show you one example of this, you would see a complete gibberish. It wouldn't like sound. I mean, or it would sound like at the first glance, it would look like English, but then when you read it, it wouldn't make any sense. So uh, one thing we could do is to play around with our softmax, which produces our distribution over vocabulary. And we can make it a little bit more peaky, such that those, uh, those higher probable words have even more higher probable words. And then we sample from this uh, slightly skewed uh, distribution. Uh, this is produced by something called uh, temperature uh, scaling. Oh, this is exactly the same slide. I don't know why that. Oh, because I have, I didn't delete this one. All right. Sorry about that. Okay. There we go. So temperature scaling uh, is done by taking your softmax. This is the, the softmax, uh, one, val one value in our softmax. And uh, you use this parameter t, and you divide the value that we put in exponentiate. You divide it by that uh, scalar t. If you use lower values of t, uh, you are going to make probabilities sharper. And if you use uh, higher values of T, you are going to soften them. Um, and we are going to use lower T's because we want to sh sharpen the distribution. So we set this hyperparameter and then we sample from the uh, now slightly skewed distribution. Another option we could do is that instead of sampling from our distribution um, produced by our softmax, we first filter k most uh, likely next word and redistribute the probability mass over them. This will avoid the situation where those really low probability words 
are samples er ever chosen. They simply do not have an option to be displayed. Um, and this is a good proposal. The only issue is that it doesn't ad dynamically adapt the number of words that are filtered. We use always the same uh, same K for no matter how peaky or flat the distribution for a given at a given time step is. Uh, so for example, on the left here, uh, because the distribution is flat, some reasonable, I mean, all of these are reasonable, reasonable options. Some of them are eliminated. And here, on the other hand, because we use the same K, I, I believe uh, six, some of these that are totally not fitting for this uh, for the next word are included as candidates. So we would like to have a more flexible options where uh, here we discard these. And this is exactly between the idea behind top P or nucleus sampling, which is you know the thing we uh, use. We use all of these, all of these, but this one is uh, uh, mega important. And here you are going to sample from the smallest possible set of tokens whose cumulative probability exceeds the probability p. So here, cumulative probability to reach cumulative probability higher than let's say uh, 0.93, you need to use all of these words because all of them have just a little bit of probability mass. Unlike here, because this one has lots of probability mass, it has already taken too much. So to reach 0.97, we just need these first three. And this is how we achieve that dynamic K uh, from before. So when you use things like ChatGPT, and this is commonly not known. Um, I mean, why would people know that there are parameters like temperature, top K and top B? Um, you might have heard people like, oh, I give the exact same prompt, but I give, get a different output. And this is because of this, we are sampling. You have the ability to, if you go to playground, uh, to set the uh, these parameters such as uh, in a way that you will get a greedy decoding, which is then not random anymore. Um, and you will always get the same output. So we have that flexibility to show always the same answer or to display a random, uh, you know, to randomly, randomly sample and get slightly different results. And today, because we use this next prediction to do not only tasks that are inherently generative, like uh, summarization, dialogue, and whatnot, we also approach classification in the setup. It's important to set the K to something that's de deterministic. Otherwise, you get different classification results, which uh, will have effects downstream. Okay, so yeah, these P and K are also always used. Like I, I didn't introduce this terminology. If, if you know, you will see top P and it will refer to nucleus sampling and top K will refer to exactly top K sampling. And these, you know, like um, the hyperparameters will be called exactly like that. And temperature will also be called temperature. Uh, here I have given you this uh, tutorial where I have taken these uh, visualizations you can then go and see how you would uh, use these decoding techniques with hugging face uh, models. So it's all about just changing these uh, hyperparameters, temperature, top P and top K. Okay, are there any questions about decoding? Yes. Uh, it's a sample from the smallest possible test. Does sample there mean consider the next sentence as part of the beam search? No. So beam search and all these other techniques are, are you know, um, I, I guess, I mean, it depends what, what exactly uh, do you have here in mind, but I would, I would recommend thinking that about them as separate things. So here, um, the, uh, the, uh, the, you do selection of the tokens before you sample and the selection depends on the, um, which tokens would give you the probability of the ma mass above some threshold you set, let's say 0.9. And depending on how the distribution at that point looks like, you will end up with you know, more, um, maybe four or maybe three. But with top P and top K, then you sample one, uh, one of those. If you had 
combine these two techniques and you are using both beam search and top nucleo sampling, you would, uh, nucleo sampling would give you maybe here, let's say, I don't I'm so bad at counting, 10 possible uh, tokens. And then if you set beam to two, you would sample two of them, two, uh, uh, two, two tokens. And you would keep these different values. Just, just like, mm -hmm. like exactly, yeah. Yeah, so this is a pre-selection for sampling, and then you sample something. Um, if you just use top B, you will sample one uh, one option, not multiple. Yes. I think we figure out like what was the award you choose from. Are you just choosing like random or based on the distribution? Based on the distribution. So here, uh, when you have uh, you you have um, you know you first do the selection pre-selection using a nucleus procedure. And that gives you, I don't know, 10 tokens. You redistribute their mass, and then you sample from that uh, distribution. And that would mean that um, if here, this was higher probable word, it, when, you, when you do pre-selection, it's still going to have higher probability than this other word. So when you um, sample from that distribution, you will pick it more than the others. But you're picking it at random. So once you might, um, amongst 10 sampling, you know, you repeat these samples, let's say 10 times, the one that's higher probable in these 10 times might be selected mm -hmm. seven times, but then others will be selected uh, in these three other uh, sampling steps. Whereas if we just use greedy decoding, you will always sample the same thing, the, the highest probable one. Yep. So wouldn't both top 10 nuclear sampling still lead to the issue where like oftentimes human speed chooses words of like zero probability? Yeah, it helps definitely with having more variants, right? And um, you, if you care about creative writing, you want to like write top up because you really want to have more, you know, randomness. If you want to ground it in something a little bit more, you know, um, you don't want to now spiral and start to use very weird words in that context. You will you will use the appropriate top B, but still, even with these procedures, um, we will sample words that are not so low probability, like human do. Mm -hmm. um, but it's not enough. There isn't enough difference for that to be a great detector of generated text, for example. So there is some differences, but not enough to, to see that. Um, there was a tool at some point, and I don't know whether it works anymore. You could, you know, extension in let's say uh, Chrome, where uh, you could, you know, pick a text on the web and it will show you some of these, you know, probabilities of those words. And then you can see how, you know, they are different for, generated or human human text. But in general, detection of generated text is, right now it doesn't work. Like we don't have things that work. Although there are products like uh, Turnin, which should detect plagiarism among students, that's, that's, that cannot be like a solid product because we literally do not have any technique right now that can distinguish between uh, well between human and generated text or human and generated images and so on it's a it's a big line of work that people try to figure out and some even think that it might be impossible like technically impossible yeah, yeah so with this approach also there's a chance of picking a word which doesn't make sense um less so less so um yeah, if this distribution was extremely flat, then yes. Um, so I don't know, I don't have in mind like how often that happens, how often that distribution is very flat. So what would this be like if you just like 494 is a uh, threshold? Mm -hmm. So one word has 493 probability uh, and the other one is 0 0.00. Mm -hmm. So we are picking from your those two, right? If we have vocabulary of size two, yes, but we do have more words and it's, um, it's uh, yeah, I suppose uh, you will pick more of um, the next, if you had really that kind of a situation where you're so close to the threshold for probability mass, 
then probably the the other word you have selected is is maybe not completely um, unprobable. Um, then again, this is a hyperparameter use set. So if you do notice, uh, is still kind of strange. You can make b be higher, uh, and then you shouldn't be seeing that situation. So, but common values that people use, I think, point six or seven for top b. It usually makes sense. It's it's not like I personally didn't need to like tune this too too much. Like for values that circulate around to be good values usually are reasonable options. Okay. So uh, with that, let's finish with the empty evaluation. Now we have seen we have a model. We know how to generate next word. Uh, we know how to change the model with the information, like with the loss. Uh, we now know how to display the words from the uh, distribution of over vocabulary. Okay, now we have produced the sequence. How do we evaluate whether that uh, ref, uh, the, whether that uh, translation is any good? Two things matter when we evaluate MT. One is adequacy. The translation should adequately reflect the content of the source sentence. And fluency. The translation should read like fluent text in the target language. Here, uh, we have an example from uh, Jacob's book. Uh, the source sentence in Spanish, Abinay le gusta Python. And then we have these with translation. In English, to Vinay, it like Python. Vinay debugs memory leaks. When I likes Python. So here, um, this is to when I it like Python, it's adequate because it kind of gives that uh, content from the source, but it's not fluent, right? Like this is not a legit sentence in, you would say in English. On the other hand, when I debugs memory leaks, it's a grammatical sentence in English, but it's not representing the content of this, um, of the uh, source sentence in Spanish, which says that Vinay likes Python. And then uh, Vinay likes Python is both adequate. It literally gives us the meaning of the source sentence, and it's also fluent uh, in, 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 in the target language in English. Mm -hmm. So you care about both of these things. The main measurement for empty evaluation that's been around for over 20 years is blue score. And it, it evaluates empty at the word or phrase level. And it's based on engram precision, precision. Basically, you have P of N is the fraction is of uh, amongst engrams appearing in the hypothesis translation. So um, in the machine translation, let's say we are looking at P or P2. So the number of two grams by grams that appear in our machine's translation. You look at how many of those uh, also appear in the reference, in the human translation. So again, you need that parallel corpus where you have human translation, and then you are doing what you say, um, engram overlap between uh, human and uh, translated uh, bigrams. Uh, this is not the blue yet. Blue is basically geometric mean of uh, these precisions. So you decide uh, that your highest uh, you know, order of n-gram is going to be capital N. You're going to then take log, pro log precisions, uh, these precisions, and that's uh, going to, you know, the average of those is, uh, and then exponent is the basically a formula for geometric mean. That's gonna be blue score. There are some caveats. First of all, you don't want to have a logarithm of zero. So uh, you are going to smooth these precisions, like add a little bit of value to never have logarithm of zero. You also will uh, uh, disallow that engram in the reference in human translation uh, can be used uh, more than once. So if you have a generation which is rubbish, two, 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 we just repeat, Two, you don't want this um, now. If we are computing p one, you don't want we, we don't want to count that two had appeared in two b or not to be twice. Rather, we want to say it appeared once. We don't want to award it for just repeating one unigram. 
Uh, also, this equation uh, in its form is, um, this equation over here is a favoring shorter translations. Shorter translations are going to have higher precisions. So there is also a brevity penalty that is introduced where uh, translations that are shorter than the human translation, then the reference are penalized. I'm not giving you exact um, you know, ways of how we do this, but I, I just want you to remember that we add these three changes. So for example, uh, we would have Vinay likes programming in Python and uh, that's human translation. And then we have systems or hypothesis translation do we now it like to program in Python? If you would compute P1 to P4, you would get these values, uh, brevity penalty. Uh, here, we don't have it, I believe. Let's see. Yeah, this is fine. Uh, so I guess, I, I don't know how exactly this brevity penalty works, but I suppose if everything is fine, you just get one. Um, yeah, and here, uh, it's it's lower than one, so it's going to lower the overall uh, blue score. Um, so yeah, I don't I don't have a point here. You call kind of you compute these precisions and then you combine them to get the blue score, and you can see here that the highest uh, highest scoring uh, translation is Vinay likes programming in his pajamas. For our source sentence that says Vinay likes Python, so now you might be confused, like why this would be a very high scoring translation. Whenever we have automatic metrics in um, for text generation, it's important to compute the correlations of human judgments of, tra of translation of or that generated text without our automatic measure. Meaning if your human gives high score for translation, your automatic metrics should give a high score and other way around. Low score by human should be followed by low score uh, by uh, automatic metrics. So standard thing when you introduce a new measurement in, in this field is to say, I believe this is a measurement. measurement. Here is my correlation with human judgments is higher than this other, other measurement. So when we ask humans, we can ask them to directly assess the adequacy and fluency. The issue here is that uh, we actually need bilingual speakers to do this uh, really well, but it's very hard to find bilingual people in any kind of, you know, in any pair of languages. So if we know someone that knows a uh, source sentence, we can ask uh, humans to compare machine translation to a human generated references. Excuse me, if your annotator knows the target, target language instead of, uh, uh, they don't need to understand the source language. And instead of asking them to do this call, uh, do these comparisons, we can also present them with two or more translation, and we can uh, ask them uh, to to rank them together with the human provided reference. In any case, you would then compare the you know the the scores from your automatic metrics with your human judgments, and what has been repeatedly found since two thousand six is that blue poorly correlates with human judgments. And this is kind of the common story in machine learning is that we have a very bad measurement, but it's easy to evaluate. Therefore, we continue to use it, although it doesn't give us proper evaluation of what we want to do, which if you just enter this field, you might think, oh, oh my God, this is wild. And to some extent, it's wild. But then what happens is that with, even with these weird measurements, we manage to make progress. Like, as we have seen today, we have had neural machine translation that has been evaluated with blue that has led us to all this large language modeling business. So even with this weird measurement, we can somehow manage to make progress. And I would say that's why that that's why why these measurements stick around. So in all of these papers, which are then nicely summarized in this blog post, you have we have seen they do not blue doesn't correlate. It's the blind to most of the valid translations and poorly exploits multiple references, unsuitable for short text, sensitive to tokenization, unsuitable for evaluating translation of high quality, blah, 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 blah. There are so many reasons. So um, if you now end up going training a machine translation system, you will end up using blue most likely because someone is gonna ask you, what, what about blue? But what I want you to remember is this is a way to get some sense of my system's performance. 
but it's not the perfect way to evaluate this. So you will end up using it, but really be aware that what you're evaluating is not, is not great. And that eventually, if you want to deploy your system or if you want to publish your work, you should do human uh, evaluation of judgments of these translations. Uh, and, you know, this is still unsolved, the quest for more reliable evaluation metrics for translation and text generation uh, continues. For example, last year, that has been a shared task where you could propose a better measurement. And today we also use a learn metric where you train a metric on your human judgments. One example is Blurt that has been proposed in 2020, which is a, I would say if you need to use a, a automatic evaluation, it's better to use Blurt than Blue. Okay, and this brings me to, to the end uh, of today's class. So next time we are gonna see, we are gonna go back to our neural machine translation and we are gonna add one special ingredient called attention and then build up to self-attention and transformers. <laughs>